Um, okay, great. Uh, so uh, let's start uh, uh, the second lecture of the Nicholas Gardner uh, uh, mini series. So the title has not changed. It's non semi simple two QFTs from 3D and equal four QFTs. And today we'll have a second lecture. So, Nicholas, please. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you all for joining us again today. Um, last time was a lot of physics. And so I hope to remedy that by providing a little bit uh, less physics today, but still just uh, enough to get me all the things I want to say. Um, but just as a reminder of what we did last time, oh, let me take this. Uh, just as a reminder of the things that we saw last time, um, we started off with a bit of the basics of 3D N equals four quantum field theories, some of the basic building blocks. There were the matter fields that we called hypermultiplets and the gauge fields, which were vector multiplets, colloquially called hypers and vectors. Um, and there were also also twisted versions of these fields that we uh, will be able to use a little bit later today. Um, within these 3D N equals four quantum field theories, there's two particularly important uh, spaces, uh, moduli spaces of vacua in these theories called the Higgs and Coulomb branches. And they serve distinguished roles in the context of topological twisting. Um, each of these is a hyperkähler manifold, or for our purposes, essentially just a holomorphic symplectic manifold. And there's interesting symmetry groups that act on them that we called the Higgs and Coulomb branch flavor symmetries. And these were denoted G sub C and G sub H for uh, Coulomb and Higgs, respectively. Um, of course, a three-dimensional N equals four quantum field theory isn't topological. And the way we were able to access the topological subsector of it is by way of the notion of a supersymmetric twist. In the three-dimensional n equals four context, there are two topological twists, um, now called the A and B twists. Uh, a twist was uh, seen elsewhere in a reduction of Donaldson-Witten theory in four dimensions. Um, the B twist doesn't arise as a dimensional reduction, but as mentioned last time, this leads to Rosansky-Witten theory for a certain choice of the 3D N equals four theory you started with. In particular, this was one of those sigma models where the hypermultiplets take values in that hyperkähler manifold used by Rosensky and Witten. Um, the A and B twists admit interesting deformations um, by background flat connections for the symmetry algebras I mentioned above, or sorry, the symmetry groups I mentioned above. Um, in particular, the a twist can be deformed by Coulomb branch flavor symmetries uh, or complexified flat connections for the Coulomb branch flavor symmetry group GC. And similarly, the B twist can be deformed by flat complexified connections for the Higgs branch flavor symmetry group. And uh, in connecting to things like quantum groups and vertex operator algebras, the central object of interest are the extended operators known as line operators. And in a 3D topological quantum field theory, these line-like defects form a braided tensor category. Um, I only showed the, the sort of categorical pictures associated to them, but I've drawn here the monoidal and uh, braiding, uh, at least pictorially. Um, last time it was mentioned that this Monoidal structure comes from fusing line operators. So you take two parallel lines and you collide them with one another. And similarly, the braiding is realized by, well, braiding two uh, line operators around one another. When we take this collision limit, this gives us a morphism between the tensor product in one direction and the tensor product in the other direction. Uh, the flat connection deformations I mentioned above uh, extend this braided tensor category to uh, something like a G crossed braided tensor category, where the uh, category C has, um, is, is realized as a direct sum or a direct integral over our flavor symmetry group G. 
where the fibers are associated with line operators that source a flat connection with holonomy G. And we were digging into the example of a free hypermultiplet last time. And that, that's where I wanted to start today. Um, I've written uh, some of the same details I wrote in the slide from the last lecture. This is a Rosensky-Witten theory with target T star C realized as the topological B twist of a free hypermultiplet. So there's no gauge fields. We just have matter fields. Um, I argued for you a description of the category of line operators coupled to a background flat connection A. Um, and it was this like infinite dimensional matrix factorization category that uh, previously had shown up in work of uh, Bensby and Nadler. And I proposed last time a sort of finite dimensional version of this category realized by some conjectural uh, Knorr periodicity argument, where rather than looking at the loop space of all of T star C and having a background connection, we just have a Lie algebra element thought of as uh, this, this sort of unique flat connection A D theta, where theta is my coordinate on the circle. Um, and this was a, a pretty good approximation when A was uh, sort of infinitesimal or like a small in some suitable sense. And the resulting finite dimensional model was in terms of matrix factorizations on our, our target space, T star C, with a super potential that is realized as the contraction of the moment map for the SL2C action on T star C with this A parameter. So this is sort of where we ended off last time. And I wanted to connect to the G crossed category, or rather than talking about infinitesimal holonomies, I wanted to talk about uh, genuine finite holonomies. And this matrix factorization perspective uh, that I was illustrating last time can be used to uh, motivate the suitable generalization for a finite holonomy G. So again, we're going to be looking at matrix factorizations on our target space, T star C. Um, but now with a different um, super potential. So rather than pairing the moment map with G, sorry, with uh, with A, we instead look at this pairing of Z and a translated version of Z that depends on our parameter G sitting inside of SL2C. Um, if I take G to be like the exponential of, of A, uh, and treat A as small, do our usual Taylor series expansion. Uh, this reduces to this um, expression up here. So this is just a finite version of what we had before. Um, so we have, in some sense, a, a curved algebra that Z and Z1 and Z2 are the generators of our algebra. We have this curving element W sub G, um, which is quadratic in the Zs. Um, and so, one natural thing to do is to replace my curved algebra instead by an honest associative algebra that's not necessarily commutative. The Z generators were bosons. So when we, because uh, we'll dualize each of them, we get two fermions because they commuted. Originally, my two fermions square to zero. And because of this curving, I get an interesting mutual commutator or rather anti-commutator with the two of them. And here I've only written the one for G is an element in a, the diagonal carton, uh, just for simplicity, but you can do it for any G and it doesn't really change the story all that much. I just wanted to keep things simple. So what we see is um, we can relate this matrix factorization category to a category of modules for this, um, generalized version of an exterior algebra, where if zeta here was one, then we'd have a genuine exterior algebra. And that corresponds to sort of the most singular fiber where my holonomy is trivial. These are what physicists call uh, genuine line operators. So the category of genuine line operators 
um, is something like modules for a two-dimensional exterior algebra, which is uh, Kazil dual to coherent sheaves on, on my target space, T star C. So in this way, we sort of realize the, the usual story of um, line operators in the in rosansky witten theory are related to coherent sheaves on my target space. And I'm sort of suppressing uh, the derived th nature of these things. Really, you should be working with the derived category of coherent sheaves and the derived category of modules for these things. Uh, so I'm going to assume those things are um, totally assumed and sort of suppress some of the support issues that I'm sure you know better than I do. Um, but we can actually do a little bit better. We have all these fibers labeled by zeta, but we can collate them all into a single algebra, or rather modules for a single algebra A, by adding a new generator to this exterior algebra generated by psi plus and psi minus that I'm calling M. It's going to be an invertible generator. So we have M and M inverse, and their product is, is one. And we're going to make them central. Um, so they commute with everything. They commute with psi plus and psi minus. Oh, my apologies. This should be uh, psi plus and psi minus on here. Um, and rather than the zeta minus one, we just replace zeta by m. And so now we have a new algebra with three generators, or perhaps four if you like, psi plus and psi minus and my two fermions, together with two central generators uh, that are inverses of one another, m and m inverse. And the anti-commutator of psi plus and psi minus is m minus one. So in this way, we we see that the direct integral of over the, over these zetas, which are C star valued, um, this uh, sort of direct integral of matrix factorization categories is equivalent to modules for the algebra A. Um, the really fun thing is that this algebra A can actually be realized by a process known as uprolling of, of a quantum group. Uh, in particular, the quantum group, um, the unrolled restricted quantum group uh, at Q equals I for SL2. Um, so next I wanted to sort of spell out what this uprolling procedure is and, um, and then try to connect all of these things to, to vertex operator algebras. May I ask um, what? There, are there, oh, yeah, of course. Uh, so no, I was gonna ask for questions. Okay, good. Good timing then. Um, where did the M come from? What like how did it you you introduced it, but I, I I kind of missed the motivation. I see where it goes, but why introduce it? Uh yeah. So the um matrix factorization categories that I write right here in principle depend on a parameter G, which is valued in the group SL2C. And um if we want to focus on just like abelian flat connections or holonomies that are, are abelian, then we get this algebra here that depends on a parameter zeta by applying a quadratic Kazul duality. And so we get a collection of categories, each labeled by a C star valued parameter zeta. And rather than thinking of a rather than think of a family of of categories labeled by C star, we can instead replace it by a single category um, identified as modules for this algebra I've written here, where zeta is sort of the value of M um, in, in this algebra A. So really, I guess I should have had something like a semi-simple here right. where the action of M is semi-simple with weight zeta, and then the fact that this category A mod semi-simple decomposes is right. essentially a statement of like Schur's lemma. Right. So this is like finitely supported uh, sheaves on on C stars. Or, well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, were, were there any other questions? Okay, great. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is this, this uprolling procedure. Um, and this goes back to work of Thomas Kreutzig and uh, many of his collaborators. Um, and I'll mention sort of what that motivation was, but let's just uh, take it step by step. 
we're going to start with the quantum group I mentioned, um, the unrolled restricted quantum group for SL2 at uh, I. This has um, five generators, EF and H. This is my SL2 triple, as well as uh, an, a group like generator K with its inverse K inverse. Um, and restricted means that I'm going to look at modules where K uh, acts in the same way as the exponential of H, so that if I have a weight vector, then K acts as like the exponential of that weight, or I to that weight, rather. Um, there's a couple of relations on this algebra. Um, e, F, and H are an SL2 triple, it's sort of what you expect them to be. Uh, they generate an analog of the universal enveloping algebra, um, together with this constraint that E squared and F squared are zero. Um, H, um, again, is sort of the Carton element of my SL2 triple, and K is its exponential. So K doesn't commute with E. Um, it has a relation where uh, it sort of anti-commutes with E um, because I squared is minus one. And similarly for F, um, I inverse squared is minus one, and so K anti-commutes with F as well. And then and we have this, a, the this usual... This condition, e, e square and F square equal to zero, this is what? Uh, why? Uh, I mean, it's something about uh, truncation, but uh, um, kind of, can you comment on them? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so if we were to forget the H generator, then E, F, and K would generate the small quantum group um, where this E squared and F squared are zero. Um, the relation to background flat connections and things of that nature is that um, E squared and F squared are central in the algebra if we hadn't quotiented it. And they'll correspond to sort of the off diagonal parts of my holonomy, or at least those their, their central values will. Like if I look at modules so, where so so they are central. Uh, I'm confused. There is this quantization parameter, and here, it, in this case, it, it's square equal to one or minus one. Uh, yeah, it, the quantum parameter is i, so it's inverse it, to it, minus it, one. It's the fourth root of the one, but uh, it's, oh, uh, it's fourth root because I I I, yeah. I forgot. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, it's Q yeah, equals that's I. Fine. It's not just arbitrary. Yeah, Q is I. No, no. It, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. this is this very much depends on working at Q equals I. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, then it's clear. But but also the small quantum group, because this is the even roots of the units. So therefore that the E and F is quotient the, the square. You don't have to go to all the, the four. The square of E and F would be zero. Yeah, exactly. Um, does that answer your question, Jan? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, it's uh, I, I simply missed missed this. Uh, the, the force root of Q is a force root of one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. So Q is a fourth root of one. Um, and then we have the usual uh, co-product and R matrix associated to, to Q equals one. Um, together with e squared equals zero and f squared is equal zero. Um, there is a family of distinguished modules for this uh, unrolled quantum group, unrolled restricted quantum group. Uh, that's a one-dimensional module labeled by an integer m. Um, they fuse by just adding their m's together. So s m1 times s m2. Uh, is S M1 plus M2. And the definition of the module is sort of what you expect. H acts by 2M, so that might not be quite as expected. Um, K acts by minus one to the M. This is the statement that we're in the restricted quantum group. And E and F act as zero on this vector. Um, if we'd chosen different weights, then we couldn't impose this last constraint. We really do need um, E and F to or we really do need to have even weights um, to be able to impose E and F act to zero. One of the 
distinguishing features of okay, this. Actually, so this is not quite a small quantum group. It's an infinite dimension because the k, there is there is no restriction on the k, the, the powers. So um, this is how I enrich it. Uh, um, yeah, the, so... The part, the part is still infinite. It's a, it's a large, but the E and F part is uh, restricted. Correct, yeah. Or, well, the, I... Maybe I'm using a different notion of restrict or of restricted. Yeah. To me, restricted says that K acts the same way H does, or at least the oh, okay. weights of K and the weights of H are tied by this this relation that I have at the top. Um, this yeah, right I, I, here. The restricted. So in principle, you can the restricted that's coming Sorry, from you... the algebra. That's a that's a piece the roots uh, the important elements of this raised to the pith, uh, or the, in this case, raised to the square equals zero. So that's a e square f square equals zero. Right? And that's in addition to this constraint on k and h, or uh, would you say that those are separate from the notion of restricted? Well, the, 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 the central part is, remains large. So the, the Cartan sub subalgebra part remains be large, but the e and the important part is small. I guess the only central element is k squared. So I haven't constrained k yeah, squared. Yeah, k, k squared, squared, yes. k squared is uh, central, yes. Mm -hmm. So I haven't, I, I, the, the center, I guess, is generated by e squared, f squared, and k squared. And I haven't constrained k squared, but I constrained e squared and f squared. Right. Like morally, k squared is going to be related to zeta that I had before. And the constraint that e and f are zero is related to my restriction to uh, Abelian flat connections. Okay, it's great. So, so <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Uh, no problem. Did you have any other questions? No, no, not at all. Okay, great. Um, so one of the distinguishing features of these modules is that if I look at the infinite direct sum over all integers m, uh, this is actually a commutative super algebra object in the category of modules for this unrolled restricted quantum group. Um, the sort of super part of this comes from K. In some sense, K acts as, uh, as my fermion number operator. So the odd ones are the odd part of my super algebra. The even ones are the even part of my super algebra. And this uprolling procedure is a way to describe modules for this super algebra object that are contained in the category D. So that's that's this thing I'm calling here, V mod sub D zero. Uh, zero uh, is something we'll get to in just a second, but this, this bottom part is meant to denote uh, uh, V modules that are contained in the category of modules for the unrolled restricted quantum group. So there's two steps to this uprolling procedure. If we want to get um, genuine modules for V, uh, we have to restrict to modules inside of D that have a trivial monodromy with the generator SM. So I take my putative module M, I tensor it with SM, and I do this double braiding. And I want this to be a trivial morphism from m tensor s to itself. And this constrains what the weights of h can be. In particular, we're not allowed to have an arbitrary choice of m. We're actually required that h acts semi-simply with even eigenvalues. Any one of those modules will have a trivial double braiding with any one of these sms. In addition, the uprolling procedure tells us that we should identify modules that differ by this fusion between or fusion with the generators S sub M. So if I have some object M that has a trivial double braiding with the S's, then I can look at a new module, M tensor V. And this is going to be a V module inside the category D. And indeed, it actually induces an equivalence between modules for V inside of D 
and a de-equivariantization of D. Uh, so the notation is that this category in the top, D superscript zero, denotes those modules that have trivial monogamy. So that's this restriction here. Um, the quotient by Z um, is this second part where we identify modules related by fusion and is often called a de-equivariantization of the action of SMs. So this has a nice physical description in terms of um, in terms of gauging asymmetry, but um, I don't think I'll say too much about that. If you're at all interested, I'm happy to say it uh, to you afterwards. Um, but we can actually do a little bit better. Rather than restricting to modules with trivial monogamy, we can restrict to modules where the monogamy is non-trivial but semi-simple. Uh, this is sort of the next simplest thing we can do. And I'll call the resulting category V mod sub D rather than having genuine modules. That's what the superscript zero meant. Um, we can have modules where the double braiding with the algebra itself isn't trivial, but um, encodes a, a twisting. Namely, we think of this M as like, as counting weights with respect to some C star action on V and the double braiding of an element um, encodes the uh, the action of that symmetry on M, or sorry, on S sub M. Namely, if I have some module uh, M that has this semi-simple monogamy constraint, I do this double braiding, uh, the monogamy is gonna be an exponential. And in some sense, you should think of this as being the action of C star on the weight M subspace. So these are, are not genuine modules for my for V um, in that you don't have a trivial double braiding with the algebra itself, but you end up having a double braiding that is actually an automorphism of the algebra. Um, and this automorphism will be, in essence, the holonomy that we've, we've been after. So in some sense, this is like zeta to the M. So we're led to the same sort of description. This entire category of modules, V mod sub D, is realized as the category of modules D that we had for the quantum group, where we require that H act semi-simply, and therefore also, also K will act semi-simply. And then we, we quotient by fusion with, with these Ms. So we do a de-equivariantization again. So this uprolling procedure is a way of starting with, with some large unrolled quantum group, finding some distinguished super algebra object in its category of modules, and then describing the category of modules for this super algebra object in terms of the category we started with. Um, it turns out we can do a little bit better. Um, v mod can actually be identified with modules for a certain subalgebra inside of the unrolled restricted quantum group. Sorry, that should be a bar. Um, and it sort of goes as follows. Uh, this was originally done for a slightly different submodule that I've I've mentioned here. Uh, namely, if I had done a direct sum over the even Ms rather than all Ms. This was again done by Thomas Kreutzig and his collaborators. Um, here we're doing a sort of Z2 extension of that where we include all integers. Um, but in any case, the basic statement is that um, fusion with these SMs doesn't change the underlying vector space, but it does shift the action of my generators as I've written here. So shifting or fusion with SM will shift the action of H by 2M times the identity matrix. And similarly, it'll shift the action of K by multiplication by minus one to the M because of this restriction constraint. And then it also shifts the action of E. And that's because of this co-product here. 
um, e acts as zero on s. So the second term doesn't matter. It doesn't change um, that part of the action of e. But k acts as minus 1 to the m on this module, as I've denoted here. So fusion with sm actually shifts the action of e by minus 1 to the m. Um, because of the form of the coproduct for f, it doesn't change f. And so shifting or fusion with sm has the effect of fixing the vector space, but altering the actions of h, k, and e while leaving f the same. So what I'm going to do is um, look at the invariant subalgebra under this automorphism. Or is it an automorphism? I think it's an automorphism. Yeah. Um, and the invariant elements are k squared because minus 1 squared is always 1. Um, we also need to combine k and e in order to get something invariant there. The minus 1s will cancel one another. And then f was already invariant. So what I'll do is I'll define new generators, m, which is k inverse squared. The inverse is just there to make things work out nicely. Um, and then I also have psi plus, where I multiply e by k, um, as well as an annoying factor of minus 2i. And I define psi minus to be f. Oh, this is not supposed to be barred. Um, so translating the action, sorry, the relations of ui sl2 to this um, new set of elements, psi plus, psi minus, and m, we get we get this algebra A that we were talking about the entire time, or at least for the last few minutes. So what we are able to conclude from this analysis is that V mod sub D, so the category of V modules inside of D modules, which was identified with this D equivariantization before, um, is the same as that category of A modules that we were able to land on by Kazul dualizing that category of matrix factorizations. So in this way, we've sort of filled out two corners of this, of this triangle. We have our uh, topological quantum field theory, the B-twist of a hypermultiplet, and we've related it, or at least its category of line operators, together with these background flat connection deformations to a quantum group, or rather an unrolled, uh, sorry, an, an uprolled, unrolled restricted quantum group, uh, this algebra A. Um, and so the next thing I wanted to illustrate was how to finish off this triangle that we've been using um, in, in the example of a free hypermultiplet. Um, but before I get into vertex algebras, are there any questions? OK, great. So the next thing I want to do is describe some of the abstract nonsense behind the relation between a three-dimensional topological quantum field theory and a boundary vertex algebra. In the same way that we saw in the beginning of last lecture, uh, turn simons theory is related to a boundary WZW model. Um, so this is uh, described described here. Um, the basic setup is we choose a boundary condition B, and this yields what I'll call a representation of my category of line operators C. What a representation means is sort of what you expect a representation of a category to mean. Um, forget about the fact that it lands in ops B for the moment. I'll mention what ops B is in a second. But the basic statement is that for every line operator, so these are the objects in my category C, I can produce from it a vector space, which is the vector space of local operators at the junction of L in the boundary condition B. So what I've done is I've taken any object L, and I'm looking at this vector space of, of local operators at the end of my line as it ends on boundary condition B. And we can take a morphism in my category, 
uh, thought of as a junction between line operators and I can collide with the boundary condition. And this will give me a linear operator, um, sorry, a linear map from the vector space for this guy, sorry, from the vector space here to the vector space associated to this guy. So in this way, we send each object to a vector space and each morphism, a linear operator, sorry, a linear map acting on those vector spaces. And of course, that's just what you would expect the representation of a category to be. You map your category from C, sorry, you produce a functor from C to vect. But it turns out this has um, got much more structure than just a representation of the category. We actually don't just land in vector spaces. We actually land in a certain um, subcategory, I guess. Um, sorry, that's not the right word to say. But we actually have more we have more structure than just the fact it's a vector space. In particular, uh, our uh, uh, when you say boundary condition, of course, I believe that physicists know what should be called the boundary condition, but uh, it cannot be just whatever an arbitrary choice. Uh, there should be some compatibility uh, conditions, and so. Uh, should we take it as a black box or what? Uh, that um, for theories, there are some for, I don't know, like for each 3DN equal four theory, there is some class of boundary conditions. And when you would twist your initial uh, 3DN equal four, it, it becomes topological. But what happened with the boundary condition when you do the twist? So I kind of miss the logic. Um, um, so for the moment, I'm, I'm not necessarily in the context of a twisted quantum field theory. My boundary condition is um, just an arbitrary boundary condition. We'll actually not be interested in topological boundary conditions at the end of the day. Um, so for the moment, I'm just in a three-dimensional topological quantum field theory. That's that's sort of the bulk living up here. Um, the category C was the category of line operators in that, that 3D TQFT. And the boundary condition is just a, a boundary condition in that topological quantum field theory. I have no idea be... what is it. There, because I don't know what uh, do you, I mean, uh, what do you call 3D TQFT? If you mean something which satisfies IT axioms, this is one story. If you, I mean, there are uh, kind of uh, extended to KFTs. Mathematicians has done some um, uh, uh, foundational, mathematical foundational work on, on, on TQFTs. So what do you mean by uh, 3D TQFT and the boundary condition? Um. And I guess in some sense, you can think of it as being defined by this representation of my category of line operators. I'm reticent to say that it is exactly in this ATIA framework you mentioned, because my boundary condition B doesn't need to be topological. In fact, we don't want it to be topological if we want to connect to vertex operator algebras. And so yeah, that, B is like an you, object in a two category or anything like that. B is... Um, you can think of it as being sort of defined by this representation. If, if you if you don't like uh, what a boundary condition, what a physicist called a boundary condition, um, it could one definition of that could be um, a functor from your category of line operators to vector spaces, um, as I've illustrated here. It's, I, I'm not saying that I do not like it. I simply do not uh, understand and or do not know which is the same. Uh, mm, yeah, you see so, these na naive pictures, like if you have something without boundary, it represents some whatever element of the algebra or object of the category. Or whatever. And if you put... Uh, uh, you consider the same thing, but with the boundary, so it should define the module or whatever, or uh, I don't know, the action of what didn't have the boundary on something with the boundary. But it's sort of, 
it's how to say it it's 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 science fiction i mean it's uh, 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 there I is some language which, which Ke kevin if you like yeah for physics, you... yeah that's why i'm asking you yeah physics, it's I, not, yeah i could for me it's yeah what uh, i know so... uh, kevin developed this uh, machinery of factorization algebras and probably factorization categories and uh, it should capture at least operator product expansion so i believe that if you have factorization say category uh, whatever in, in 3d then and if you insert something in it then you can speak about factorization structure there but i don't know what's either okay it's a question is there a mathematical framework for what what you're saying I would say the factorization perspective you mentioned is about as close to my intuition and these pictures that I'm drawing as, as you'll likely get. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, if, if you're happy with that perspective, I think that's the one you should take because these collisions and actions uh, all come from the operator product expansion that shows up in, and is central to the, the factorization perspective. So I'm uh -huh. imagining I have a stratified factorization algebra where in the bulk, it's a three-dimensional factorization algebra. If I have open sets that are contained entirely in the interior of my three manifold, then it's usual factorization perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but if I have a boundary um, to that three manifold, I need to specify some data there. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I need to specify what I assign to open sets that end on the boundary. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Um, okay. okay. The so vector, the, the local operators on, on, here yeah. are yeah. are are elements of that vector space. You mm -hmm. can kind of, if you will, imagine I have some hemisphere that surrounds this local operator. That's going to be an open set um, in this manifold with boundary, and uh, the vector space of these local operators is the the vector space you assign to to that open set. And the action of these local operators is the usual Swiss cheese kind of mm -hmm. operad yeah. that you know and yeah. love. Yeah, in case um, of topological, and then, but if it's mixture uh, topological holomorphic or something, it's not entirely Swiss it's, cheese. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. But I think the factorization perspective is is the right one to take. It's okay. definitely the sort, the sort of intuition that... Uh, goes into the, the kinds of constructions that we're going to using here but yeah of course we we aren't using a fully topological thing um so it's it's not quite swiss cheese but the pictures i think are are morally the ones that you want to use mm -hmm. okay okay thank you yeah of course um i, I don't have a quick question so uh, the word factor yeah. I think has been used <laughs> during the uh, conversation here so the matrix factorization is one thing, but here, since you're talking about the VOA, there is also, uh, you, you also mentioned the factorization algebra. So this is a yeah. unique sense of a Frank, uh, Ben Sve Frankel's book, or? Um, or I was more, I mean, uh, I, I'm sort of I would say closer to the Costello, Costello School, Costello yeah. Guillem. Guillem. Um, I don't think they're totally unrelated, but I I was more speaking about the Costello Guillaume factorization algebras, and I believe that's what Jan was talking about as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Are there any other questions? Okay, great. Um, so, um, as I've said a couple times, we're not necessarily interested in topological boundary conditions. These are the sort of things that you might have seen in like a uh, two category of boundary conditions. We're not interested in something like that. Uh, instead, we're, we're going to be interested in what's called a holomorphic boundary condition. So the local operators on the boundary are going to be some holomorphic type factorization algebra. Um, in that in that context, these vector spaces acquire more structure um, because we can we can draw these hemispheres that I was illustrating before there's an action of this holomorphic factorization algebra on these junctions. 
Um, moreover, it commutes with the collision that I had up here because I'm free to collide on the boundary um, and then collide in the bulk, or I can collide from the bulk and then from the boundary. And those two operations commute with one another. And so rather than just landing in vector spaces, we have more structure. In particular, we land in the category of modules for this algebra that I'm calling ops B. Ops meaning local operators or observables or what have you. Um, and B denotes the fact that they're the local operators on my boundary condition B. And so if this is a holomorphic boundary condition or rather this algebra of boundary local operators is some holomorphic factorization algebra uh, or a chiral CFT or a vertex operator algebra, uh, then we have a really nice rich dictionary between how to translate from the bulk, the three-dimensional TQFT to the boundary, this um, vertex operator algebra or chiral CFT or holomorphic factorization algebra. Um, and the dictionary is, is listed here at the bottom. Um, a line operator, again, is a VOA module. That's sort of how this, um, this representation of C works. That's just the sphincter I had above. A junction between two line operators, which is a HOM in this category C, is of course a HOM in the matrix factorization category. Sorry, sorry, in the vertex operator algebra module category. So for every junction O, that's this guy up here, um, I should be able to get a vertex operator algebra map uh, between the two modules associated to line operator L and L prime. Um, a more interesting thing that isn't necessarily contained in the representation functor I was mentioning above is that the space of states my quantum field theory should associate to a surface, and this is in the sort of ATIA style framework where in the bulk I have a 3D TQFT, I can ask for what that TQFT assigns to a surface, and that will be the vector space of states on that surface. Um, this will be translated to the vector space of conformal blocks of my uh, boundary vertex operator algebra, or factorization homology or something of that nature. And you can consider um, blocks where you have extra modules that aren't just the vacuum module, and that will be translated to the vector space of states in the presence of a defect line operators pier piercing your surface. And if our bulk TQFT admits deformations by uh, by background flat connections, for example, these whole this whole structure should be able to be deformed by this type of flavor symmetry. So we should be able to deform our boundary vertex algebra by background flat connections. Um, we should be able to extend this um, functor from just modules to, uh, of course, twisted modules. And um, we'll have state spaces uh, that sort of live over the moduli of flat connections or loc, loc G of sigma and, and so on. So in this way, we can translate data uh, that we're interested in the bulk, like the category of line operators or the vector space of states in terms of the boundary vertex operator algebra. So in this way, we can access directly what the category of line operators is if we weren't able to access it by some other means. This free hypermultiplet example is almost too easy where we could do everything um, without too much work. But in more interesting situations, you sort of only have access to the vertex operator algebra, for example. And in this way, you can use the category of modules for that vertex algebra as a model for the category C. Namely, when you have a sufficiently nice boundary condition, the representation that you have up here actually turns into an equivalence or um, phrased differently, you sort of take the onsots that it is an equivalence and 
thereby describe the category of line operators in terms of modules. Of course, if you had some other description of what that category is, then you'd try to prove some equivalence of that other description and the category of modules for the boundary vertex algebra. So this is the, the general type of framework that we're gonna be working in. In the context of Chern simons theory, this is morally what, um, what Witten did to get Jones polynomials out of Chern simons theory. Um, in the non-abelian setting, it's much harder to compute things uh, directly. You can do some simple path integral techniques, but if you're doing things with real uh, knots and links, then it gets quite hard to do path integral computations. And instead he translated everything in terms of the boundary WZW model and used this equivalence of categories to really push um, what you can do in a, an algebraic fashion rather than doing hard analysis, which may or may not be science fiction. Uh, Nicholas. Uh, yeah. This story, if you work indeed with the boundary conditions, so boundary conformal field theory, like with the Minavit, and indeed you have VOA, because you can collide the separators, you cannot speak about um, conformal blocks as a vector bundle without this um, collision. But uh, when you make a, a relation to quantum groups, this factorization structure somehow uh, disappears and it is replaced by the usual braided monoidal structure. So which means that um, this VOA uh, is necessary structure is necessary only when indeed you work literally with uh, with the boundary theory. But when you make a link to quantum group, it should be a separate mathematical statement that yeah. chiral algebra you get. It's kind of, it gives rise. It's it's kind of a, a, the different structure that what I mean. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. There um, is much more structure in the vertex operator algebra, as you say. There's like um, these tensor products that depend on the parameter Z where that's the separation of your points. And you can extract from that data a braided tensor category. Um, and that would be the thing that you would try to compare to the quantum group. Um, yeah. But I totally agree the VOA is much more data um, than what you would need, but it certainly is, it certainly contains the data you need. Mm. Or at least mm -hmm. optimistically does. Mm. Yeah, okay, so it's indeed, but there are different types of VOA, and you mentioned in your first talk that it will be sort of a logarithmic a vertex yeah. operator algebra, and, and so that's kind of, uh, uh, does your uh, 3D uh, theory knows what, uh, uh, what kind of VOA will be, um, on the boundary, or well, it's it depends on the choice of the boundary theory. So for one choice, um, it can be say rational, for another logarithmic. Is it possible? Um, we will. I, I'll mention some aspects of that. Um, but one sort of salient feature is that if you have two boundary vertex operator algebras that you expect to describe the same bulk quantum field theory then they should in turn be quote unquote Morita equivalent. Namely, yeah. if I have to, if I have like churn simons theory, it could in principle admit multiple boundary conditions that have vertex operator algebras on them. In fact, this is actually the case. And they both have to be rational because churn simons line operators form a semi-simple category. And if you have two vertex operator algebras that you expect to model that category, they better be rational because your category of modules has to be semi-simple if you want to match the bulk line operators. So it's actually quite a, a deep point. If you do have multiple boundary conditions, each of which furnishing a vertex operator algebra, 
that you expect to be able to equivalently describe line operators in the bulk, they are necessarily equivalent to one another as categories or braided tensor categories. Um, and even though the algebras are not the same, they have to be Morita equivalent, or at least the VOA version of that. Uh, and uh, another question that about the uh, uh, space of states. So mathematically, yeah. uh, this uh, sp vector space should be finite dimensional because of some, I don't know, uh, 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 duality things that you should be able to take the dual or you should have a pairing in order to define, for example, invariant of the three manifold. Uh, but uh, from the physics perspective, you can have this H of sigma to be infinite dimensional, yeah? And so uh, uh, yes. uh, in the end, your quantum group, whatever uh, uh, you it's possible that you consider uh, not necessarily finite dimensional representations of a quantum. Um, I don't think that is necessarily the case. Oftentimes, the infinite dimensionality um, is sort of in the derived parts of things. So here, I was not saying derived, but really, you should have the adjective derived on every single one of these things. So it should be derived morphisms or extensions in the category of VOA modules. And it should be some derived version of conformal blocks that you're after. And so even if the conformal blocks themselves are actually finite dimensional, you can often find infinite dimensional um, derived spaces. And so um, I totally agree that it is a, a very subtle point to address um, when you're trying to understand how these infinite dimensional state spaces glue together in order to get three manifold invariants. And that was something I said in my very first slide where non-semi-simple TQFT is hard. And one of the reasons is because these state spaces are often infinite dimensional. And therefore the partition functions that you get by doing the sewing and gluing procedures that we know and love are often infinite dimensional, or sorry, they're often uh, divergent or need like really subtle regularization or some clever trick. And mm -hmm. so by no means do I mean to say that it's going to be a simple thing or even that it's totally established. Um, the, the axiomatic TQFT literature still doesn't have access to what physicists would call the entire space, space of states um, in these uh, quantum field theories that I'll be talking about next time, the ones mm -hmm. that realized okay. the quantum group um so i don't mean to, to to trivialize it it's a very very subtle and hard problem um here i'm just sort of sketching the basic pieces but there's a very deep story that still hasn't totally been fleshed out yeah okay thank you yeah of course um so the thing i wanted to do was tell you about a boundary vertex algebra for this example that we've been going through uh, that of a free hypermultiplet. Um, if you'd like to, you can follow the steps of the derivation of this boundary vertex algebra. Um, we say lots about it in the paper I have with Tudor and Thomas Kreutzig and Nathan Gear. Um, but the punchline is that if you look at the same sort of holomorphic Dirichlet boundary condition you saw in Chern Simon's theory, uh, this as well will give you a boundary vertex algebra for this hypermultiplet example. And you might remember um, way back uh, less than 24 hours ago, I actually said that this theory is actually a, a Chern-Simons theory based off of the PSL 1 slash 1 super Lie algebra. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the boundary vertex algebra we get is a PSL one slash one current algebra, also called a symplectic fermion VOA or fermionic currents. Um, it admits a natural deformation by flat SL2C connections. Um, this this uh, one over Z pole is usually not there, um, but, but it can be introduced as a deformation of the symplectic fermion vertex operator algebra 
And the fact that you have something that's SL2C valued rather than uh, a GL2 is because you need to require that this thing is symmetric in alpha and beta. Um, and that, that translates to this being an SP2 uh, connection. But in any case, um, when that connection is zero, we get the symplectic fermion vertex operator algebra on the nose. Um, its category of modules can actually be written equivalently in terms of the modules of the zero modes, uh, psi alpha comma zero. And these are the same psi plus and minus that I had uh, a couple slides ago by the usual Kazula type duality, we can relate modules for the symplectic fermion VOA to coherent sheaves on, on T star C. Um, when A is um, one of these abelian flat connections we've been talking about, where it's A, D, Z over Z, um, where A is a generic parameter, then we actually land on something that has a trivial category of modules. Uh, namely, we land on the free fermion. There's an equivalence between the symplectic fermions with this generic background and uh, a collection of free fermions, which has a trivial category of modules, namely it's equivalent to vector spaces. And I've sketched down below how this equivalence works out um, in, in this example. Um, if epsilon is non-zero, so A is, is non-generic, then this is not going to be an equivalence. But when epsilon is zero, then this thing is actually invertible and you can you can go back and forth between the free fermion VOA and the symplectic fermion VOA. Um, the last thing I wanted to do was connect it back to this uprolling thing that I mentioned before. Um, if we want to be able to go from the sort of infinitesimal thing in terms of the connection A or this uh, sort of simplified finite dimensional connection uh, little a, um, we can actually extend that to a finite version where we instead look at modules that aren't honest VOA modules, but we're called twisted modules. In particular, I'm going to just talk about abelian flat connections because life is short. Um, and so what we're going to do is use the C star um, automorphisms of the symplectic fermion VOA to uh, produce twisted modules. So this works as follows. We take our symplectic fermion VOA and we decompose it in terms of weight spaces for this C star action. Back here, this is just the C star action that scales psi plus with weight one and psi minus with weight minus one. Um, so when we do this, we actually find that the symplectic fermion VOA's weight zero part is actually a sub VOA. Um, moreover, it has a name. It's, it's called the singlet VOA uh, for P equals two. Um, moreover, these um, higher weight spaces are modules for the singlet VOA. And moreover, they're simple current where if I fuse them with one another, uh, I just sum the weights together. Um, the um, modules for the symplectic fermion VOA, the whole thing are distinguished um, inside of all of the singlet modules as having a trivial monogamy with these with these subspaces S sub M in the exact same way as we saw V uh, being a sum over the quantum group modules um, realized generalized module, sorry, the genuine modules for V mod or for V, I guess, um, had some trivial monodromy constraint with the generators S sub M in the same way here, the symplectic fermion VOA modules are distinguished by having a trivial monodromy constraint with the with the sort of generator SF1, or you could impose all of them as well. But in any case, um, we get an equivalence, or sorry, we get a functor, which leads to an equivalence. If we look at symplectic fermion, sorry, if we look at singlet module VOA, sorry, singlet VOA modules that have trivial monogamy with 
these generators SFM. That's what this zero denotes. We can build a functor from this subcategory of modules with trivial monodromy to the category of modules for the symplectic fermion VOA. And the form of it is the exact same as what we saw with the unrolled quantum group. We take our module M for the singlet and tensor it with the symplectic fermion VOA, this infinite sum. Um, and the resulting thing will be a symplectic fermion VOA module. And in this way, we get an equivalence of categories between the de-equivariantization of this trivial monodromy subcategory by fusion with, with these simple currents in exactly the same way as what we saw before. Um, more generally, rather than just having a trivial monodromy, we can look at monodromy for uh, with, with these simple currents being semi-simple. So again, this is a subcategory of all simple, uh, of all singlet modules. Um, but we can, again, do the de-equivariantization of this category by identifying modules with their fusion um, with these symplectic fermion components. And in that way, we can access the category of twisted modules, where now the, the twist parameter zeta um, is, isn't trivial anymore, but can be something interesting. And um, this is the sort of precisely the thing, the thing that we saw with the um, with the unrolled quantum group. Um, I think this is probably a good place to stop for today. The next thing I wanted to do was to describe how this story changes um, when we extend to, or when we look at the um, quantum field theory associated to the whole quantum group for SLN. Uh, rather than the little subpart that is seen by supersymmetric by sorry from Chern Simons theory. So um, that's what will happen next time. Um, I think I'll stop here and uh, see if there are any questions. Yeah, thank you very much. So let me just repeat are there any questions? So you said this uh, is going to oh thank you. <laughs> uh, so you, you described this vertex um algebra this uh, called a symplectic formula. Yeah. Um, so this uh, will be something related with the uprolling of the quantum groups. The uprolling of the quantum group there are infinite many uh, reducibles because of the uh, gradation. And here, um, you do you also have infinite many reducible representations? Yeah, so one thing I forgot to mention, um, mm. which I definitely should have, was that the singlet VOA um, is equivalent to this unrolled quantum group, or namely the category of modules for the singlet VOA oh, is I equivalent so is to the, the unrolled quantum group. Yeah, okay. so this is like a literal translation between the two of them um it's okay. not just some some happenstance yeah sorry i i should have <laughs> that's something i should have uh definitely ended with uh that is a, a very good point um yeah so this this should be um the same sort of uh thing that i was talking about in the vertex sorry in the quantum group story there are definitely an infinite number of simple mm -hmm. uh modules for sf0 but um, the symplectic fermion VOA only has uh, like one simple module. Uh -huh. um, essentially, the, the symplectic fermion VOA um, has the vacuum module. Um, if you think of these as like uh, uh -huh. modules for the Lie algebra PSL 1 slash 1, then you just have the one dimensional module that's simple. And the universal enveloping algebra is like a, an iterated extension of that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, so symplectic fermion VOA only has one. The singlet has, has many more than one, um, mm -hmm. an infinite number actually.
Yeah, I, I was going to ask because for the triplet, they were yeah you have for only finite number of uh, um, vertices. Yeah, and yeah. That, so that's the, where I was triplet... uh, corresponding SR two in the quantum SR two in the triplet case. That's uh, in the K also uh, case powers um, also just uh, having additional conditions. Yeah, so you might know that for p equals two, the triplet is actually the even subalgebra of the symplectic fermion VOA. So okay. if I had the even sum here, um, so if I had taken only the uh, even m's, then mm -hmm. that would have been equivalent to this uprolling procedure where I do a sum over the even m's as well. And, and in that way, you can uproll the unrolled quantum group to land on something for the triplet or for the symplectic fermion VOA. And the triplet story was actually the one that was done first. And that was uh, done by Thomas Kreutzig and Gayutinov. And oh, there's another one that I'm forgetting off the top of my head. Yeah, there, there are many of them. Um, but this uprolling procedure and the triplet uh, and its connection to the singlet and the unrolled quantum group um, is, is exactly what what you might expect. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, more questions? Well, if not, uh, thanks again. And tomorrow we will have uh, kind of a official M seminar. Uh, and it will be a, a, a third lecture of this lecture mini series. Thank you, Nicholas. So see you tomorrow. Of course. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Mm-hmm.